Augustine was a distinguished teacher. He was a philosopher from the fourth century. He was a man of great intellect and learning, but he lived in conflict because he believed in God. He believed Christianity was true, but at the same time, he lived a very immoral life. And he knew that what he was doing was wrong, but he just felt powerless to quit. So once uh, the story goes that while visiting a friend, Augustine heard this divine message, singing words, take and read, take and read. But he didn't recognize the song, so he just assumed this was a message from God to read the Bible. And so he found a Bible, he opened it, and he started to read at the very place that he opened. And it was Romans 13 that says, let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Augustine wrote that it was in that moment that his life was instantly changed. From that moment, he went to become one of the most central figures in the Christian church. A thousand years later, in the 16th century, a man named Martin Luther was a monk, and he was attempting to live a holy life the best that he could. He wanted to be right in the eyes of God, but he found that the more he tried to please God, the more distant he felt from God. He couldn't find peace, and he couldn't find joy. In fact, he felt that God had this impossible standard that God required something of him, a righteousness from him that was at a level that he could not attain. And he found himself tormented and conflicted. And then one day, Martin Luther was reading Romans and his eyes fell on Romans 1.17. For in it, the righteous of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. From that moment on, nothing would ever be the same in Martin Luther's life. He realized for the first time that righteousness, the, what, the, the, the holy life that he was seeking, could not be attained by works. It could only be received by faith. And, and not only was Martin Luther's life changed, but that moment also became the catalyst for the Protestant Reformation. Many years later, another man named John Wesley was reading Martin Luther's preface to his commentary on the Book of Romans. And he found that his own heart he writes, was strangely warmed by God. And even though he had already entered the ministry, even though he'd been a missionary to the natives in America, Wesley felt reborn. His life was powerfully changed. And out of his ministry came the evangelical awakening of the 18th century. The course of European history would forever be changed by that revival. Those are just a handful of stories about how God, using just one book of the Bible, can not only change our lives, but change the world. But the Bible does not hold the same power, the same respect, the same authority that it once did. And I would argue that belief in God is probably about the same. You know, it might say, in God we trust on our money, but there is not one belief or one religion or even one God of America. You know, we have the atheist that says God doesn't exist. Life is random. It is, it's without any divine purpose. We're down here and we're all on our own. There is no true religion since there is no God. And every person must determine for themselves what is right and what is wrong. There's also the agnostic who will admit they don't know if there is a God. And if there is, then we can't really know much about him. And since we can't know much about him, there's very little uh, effort in trying. And then you have people of faith. And they are the ones who practice Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism. We are Christians. So what do Christians believe? How does a Christian get to heaven? What, what do we have to do? You know, Christians profess that we believe in a living and personal God, and because we believe that this God is personally involved in human history, we also believe that he revealed himself to us, that God has given us a personal revelation of himself in the 
personage of Jesus and that we have that same revelation in his book that we call the Bible. As Christians, we claim to believe that the Bible is God's word and it's his message to us. And that brings us to a very important question. When you open the Bible, do you expect God to speak to you personally? Because if you truly believe that the Bible is God's word, then you should. You see, just like Augustine and Martin Luther, God loves you. And so he wants to communicate his truth to you. He hasn't left you down here to fend for yourself. He has spoken to us in words that we can understand. They are recorded here for us in the Bible. And just like Augustine, we must take and read. Here in church, every week, our challenge is to do something with what he has given us. Our challenge when we open the book of Romans, or any book of the Bible, is to view it as God's message for us, not just then, but today. And the book of Romans is just as powerful today. Last year, before Christmas began, we had studied uh, the book of Romans up to chapter eight. And I wanted to just take a pause and reintroduce our study. John Calvin once said, if a man understands Romans, he has a sure road open to help him understand the entire Bible. So here, very briefly, is your TLDR. Who wrote the book of Romans? Paul. Uh, Paul is a product of three different cultures. He's a Hebrew, religiously. Culturally, he's a Greek. Politically, he's a Roman citizen. And he writes the book of Romans to believers in Rome. Yes, of course. Romans 1, 7 says to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Ironically, at the time of writing this letter, Paul had never even been to Rome. When was the book of Romans written? About AD 58. So that's 25 years after Jesus. And he's writing this from the city of Corinth. What is Romans about? Uh, the book of Romans provides us with a very concise summary of the gospel. In its first chapters, Paul outlines doctrine, that is, pillars of truth, uh, things that we know about ourselves, things that we know about God. And then the last chapters focus on advice and encouragement for how to live out our lives once we have this knowledge. And as we saw from our three examples at the top of this, as to what can happen to a person who reads these verses the book of Romans can have a very powerful effect. The book of Romans can have a very powerful effect. This book has literally altered the course of human history. Normally, when we think about important writings, we tend to think of you know, uh, classical literature or a political document, you know, books like Pride and Prejudice and To Kill a Mockingbird and Anna Karenina and Jane Eyre and The Great Gatsby, they've all influenced people because of the, the common sharing that we all you know, read it, and then the enjoyment they bring. And these books have been read and reread by millions of people. Just the same, we have political documents like our United States Constitution or the Declaration of Independence, and they have shaped our nation, they've shaped the world. These documents have been scrutinized, analyzed, debated, defended for hundreds of years. But the book of Romans has existed for almost 2,000 years and has transcended both political and geographical boundaries. It has been analyzed and read by hundreds of millions, if not billions of people. And it has caused indisputable and powerful effects wherever people take it seriously. It has caused people to risk everything for the sake of its message. And I believe that wherever it is read, wherever it is received today, it'll still have that same powerful effect. And there's a very good reason for that assumption because I think it contains a very powerful message. Why are we studying this book? Because the book of Romans has a powerful message from God. Romans contains the heart of the gospel. It speaks of the grace of God. It explains his wonderful plan of salvation. The central theme and great message of Romans can be summarized in these two verses found in chapter one. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, 
to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The entire book of Romans is an explanation of how the gospel applies to each and every person, how it has the ability to change our eternal destiny and how it can produce life worth living, which means it can have a very powerful impact. One Christian theologian said of the book of Romans, it is the most basic, the most comprehensive statement of true Christianity. And if that's true, then we need to understand its message. So when you open the Bible, do you expect God to speak to you personally? Because if you view this book only as a letter that was written to some random people living thousands of years ago in a place called Rome, you will undoubtedly miss what God is trying to talk to you about. If you only see the book of Romans as historical, then you're going to miss how it is contemporary. If you approach the book of Romans only as theological or doctrinal, you will undoubtedly miss its personal message to you. There is no doubt that studying it will give you insight. It will give you the best doctrinal teaching anywhere. Its value as a theological work is without question, but God's intent is not to enrich your appreciation of theolo theology. That is not why we take and read. God wants to change your life. The Bible should change your life. The time that you spend together at church should change your life. Are you ready for that? I hope so. Because if you open yourself up to receiving the message that's in this book, you will never be the same. The gospel is powerful in this book. So where did we leave off? A few weeks ago, we said we were all the adopted children of God. That in itself is an incredible thought, that we are co-heirs with Christ, not just children, but royalty. God saw us, wanted us, adopted us into his family. We are joint heirs, sons and daughters of the King of Kings, and therefore we have all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities of that. The bad news is, the Bible says, that the punishment for sin is death. And there is nothing that we can do. There's no community service that we can do. There's no fancy Hollywood lawyer who can get us off the hook. But the good news is, Romans 8 says, God made us innocent through the cross of Christ. That's what being justified means. It's not a matter of us choosing God, but rather God who has chosen us. It's not about our worthiness or our righteousness or our good deeds. It is about God's grace, his mercy, his love. And all of that sounds great. All of that sounds like good news. But now as we enter chapter 9, we see Paul slump into sadness. Paul says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to, bring, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Which is very interesting, because I want to show you really quick how chapter 8 ended. Chapter 8, if you remember, it ended. Paul says, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul says nothing exists that can separate you from Christ's love. And then at the top of the next chapter, Paul says, but if I could cut myself off from Christ, I would give up my salvation if it meant that my fellow Jews could be saved. If I could cut myself off, I would, for the sake of them. And Paul weeps that his own people have rejected the Messiah. And this seems doubly bad because all through history, Israel has been God's chosen people. They have been God's favored people. 
Even as we read the prophecy about Christmas in Micah, we saw that, you know, it was foretold the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. That means that all eyes should have been on Bethlehem. Everybody should have been watching Bethlehem because that's where the Messiah was to be born. And so if his own people rejected him, does that mean that God's word failed? Did the Bible fail in that moment? Paul answers that in the next verses. He says, But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all the children of Abraham, because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Paul says, No, the word of God did not fail. And he goes on to say, that if you really look at what being a child of Abraham means, what does it really mean to be a child of Israel? What does it mean to be an Israelite? Because Abraham's first son, right, was Ishmael. And if you were a descendant of Ishmael, you could say, I am a child of Abraham. But the promise did not carry through Ishmael. So he says, it's not about flesh and blood if it doesn't count through Ishmael. So Paul points out that a true child of Abraham, they are the ones who believe the promise. That means the promise is according to the spirit. The promise is according to grace, not flesh and blood. Verse 9 says, for this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah will have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And then he goes on to point out another story. He says, now consider Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau, they're in the womb. They're not even born yet. And Rebekah was told that one would serve the other, that God would favor one over the other. And this is before either of them had any chance to do any works. One has neither been good nor bad. One has neither sought God or rejected God. They're not even born yet. You know, there's this claim, sometimes you may have heard, You're only a Christian because your parents are Christian. You're only a Christian because you live in America. You know, if you'd been born somewhere else, you'd believe something else. But Paul says, you're not accepted because your parents are Christians. You're not accepted because of your nationality. Your relationship with God has always been by faith, according to his purpose, according to grace. Verse 15 says, For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So when God says this to Moses, he's not just declaring his power. He's not saying, accept me or reject me. He, 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 he's not saying that just because he's God. Okay? His chosen nation of people had rejected him. They were worshiping a golden calf. And so in this moment, God is prepared, if Moses is okay with this, if Moses says yes, God is going to destroy all of them and just start over again with Moses. Wipe them all out. God's mad. But Moses, in this moment, stands between God's wrath and the people. And he argues that God spares the people. So in God's sovereignty, he shows mercy, and he does. And he says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And this is important because Paul is also making an argument towards grace. And he is saying, this isn't new. He's saying, this is how it's always been. God spared the people then out of compassion. He he spared the people then because a mediator stood between him and the people and argued for their life. And that is still the same thing that's required today. 
Paul says we're not born into it, we cannot earn it. And then he says in verse 16, so then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. It's always been about mercy. It's always been about God's grace alone. So then Paul carries his argument a step further, and he addresses the issue of those on whom God's mercy doesn't fall. What about the people that aren't chosen? What about them? And he uses another example from the book of Exodus. He uses the example of Pharaoh. God performs all these miracles, sends all these plagues, and Pharaoh never concedes. How come? Romans 9, 17 says, For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, he has mercy on whom he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Now, does this mean that God deliberately made Pharaoh reject him so that he could make an example out of Pharaoh? It sure sounds that way. You know, God created a being, gave him life, even though he knew in advance that that person would never accept him. Made a person that he knew in advance that would reject him. That seems very unfair. That doesn't seem very heavenly father-y, right? Doesn't seem very loving. And I get it. This argument has caused a lot of people to leave their faith. It's as if God is saying, worship me or die. Sounds harsh, doesn't it? Sounds narcissistic. Worship me or go to hell. How do we answer that? Well, let's say I have a massive mansion that sits on a a ranch. And it's a cold January evening. And you're standing outside in one of my fields And I yell to you and I invite you, come into my house. I've got everything. I've got Wi-Fi in every room. Uh, I've got tons of bedrooms. And yes, there's people staying here, but I've got a room just for you. You won't even share this room with anybody. I've got a warm meal prepared for you. Okay? And I've even got clean clothes for you. And and so you, you run to the front door. And as you're running to the front door, you get mud and horse poop all over your shoes. And, and I say, come on in. But hey, hey, just do me a favor. I've got really thick white shag carpet in there. Really plush shag carpet. It's, it's so warm, it's wonderful. Could you do me just a favor? Could you take off your shoes first before you come inside? And you say, what? How dare you tell me what to do? I, I, Hey, buddy, it's okay. You know, I want you to come inside. I've got a place for you. I'm just saying it's really clean in there. <laughs> I try to keep it clean for everybody. And you can stay as long as you want. Heck, I've got a fresh pair of warm, uh, snuggly booties for you waiting inside. You can, you can wear them while you eat uh, you know, the, the warm dinner I have for you. Just do me a favor and take off the shoes. And you're like, no way. You can't tell me what to do. I can't believe you would ask me to do that. Well, (laughs) then I can't let you inside. I'm sorry. And then you say, man, I thought you loved me. And you turn back and walk out into the cold. You'd prefer to stay outside then just get rid of a pair of dirty shoes? I can't force you. And I would shut the door and I would turn around and you would be defiant and angry that I didn't let you in. You're upset that I made a rule. You're hurt. And you say, "Ah, I thought you loved me. This is God's kingdom. Each of us is stained with darkness and sin. And we can enter into glory, but we can't be stubborn about it. We can't be disobedient about it. We have to accept God's invitation. We have to relinquish 
our sins. We have to leave them behind in order to be welcomed in. But if we choose to hold on to our sin, if we choose to hold on to our desires, then we make the choice to suffer outside of his love. But didn't God know we would make that choice? Couldn't he, couldn't he try harder to save us? Couldn't he prove himself to us? Maybe if he proved himself to us, we would be more acceptant. God, Paul answers that question in Romans 9. He says, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But you are, O oh man, to answer back to God. Will what is molded say to this molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? Right? Why should I change? God made me like this. If God made me like this, why is he going to punish me? He made me. That's not fair. He made me this way. Okay, but let's consider Paul's example. Let's consider the story with Pharaoh. Moses came to Pharaoh and said, let God's people go. And Pharaoh said, I don't know this God. And Moses said, okay, let me introduce him to you. And then God made his presence known through water turning to blood, frogs, lice, flies, the livestock got sick, the people got boils, hail, locusts, darkness, death of the firstborn. How about now, Moses says. <laughs> Do you believe me now? And the Bible says Pharaoh's heart was hardened. One theologian says men are not lost because they are hardened. They are hardened because they are lost. And they are lost because they are sinners. The truth is, Pharaoh made his own choices. He was given more evidence of God's greatness and goodness and faithfulness and mercy than anyone who has ever lived. This man asked for proof. He was given proof, and it was still not enough to change him. Jesus tells a story about a man who goes to hell, and when he sees his fate, he begs God, send a messenger from heaven to go and warn my family. I don't want them to end up here. He says, then I beg you, Father, to send them to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Wow. Wow. In other words, if they don't believe this book, if they don't believe the words that are written in this book, if they are not convinced from the testimony of this book, there is nothing else in the world that would convince them. And when the atheist and the agnostic says, I will, I'll believe if you can prove it. I'll believe if you can prove it. No, you won't. Because Pharaoh didn't believe. We're going to close with the end of the chapter. Verse 30 says, What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is, a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith but as it were, based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So this is Paul's summary. This is Paul's end to chapter 9. He says those who were looking for salvation did not find salvation. They were looking in the wrong places. And he says those who were, not even, who were not even looking for salvation, they found it. The people who are trusting in obedience to save them didn't find it. The people who are trusting in nationality to save them didn't find it. And then we, we as an observer, right, we look at the story and we say, oh, but come on, I mean, the Jews, 
they were trying so hard. Their, their intentions are good. I mean, they're obeying all the rules. They're observing all the holidays. They're reading all the right books. They're wearing the right clothes. They're eating the right food. And God doesn't count any of that? Like God's just going to cast them aside? That doesn't seem fair. Surely all their hard work should count for something. Well, that would be a solid argument if right standing could be obtained by hard work. But it's not. Right standing is only found in Jesus. The last words of chapter 9, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Zion is another name for the city of Jerusalem. So why is Jesus a stumbling block for Jerusalem? Well, he's a stumbling block for everybody who puts their faith in the law. He's a stumbling block to everyone who puts their faith in nationality. And that was just the Jews. Are we off the hook as Christians? What does someone need to do in order to be saved? What would you say? Well, you should believe in Jesus and uh, be a member of a church. That saves. You should believe in Jesus and you should observe, you know, all the practices like baptism and communion. That saves. We should believe in Jesus and it probably helps if you're from a Christian family. That saves. You should believe in Jesus and you should, you know, you should not do certain things. Don't, don't do these things. That's, that saves. No, the truth is Christ can become as much of a stone and stumbling block and a rock of offense to, to the nation of Israel as he can to us, right? People who call themselves Christian because they are in the church and they think that all the things that they do make them a Christian rather than the other way around. What makes you a Christian? Well, I go to church and I sing the songs and I give the tithe and I was baptized and I take communion and I volunteer uh, with a ministry and, be, and because of that, no, that is a stumbling stone. Because if, if Christianity was based on true saving faith, then they would know that all those other things could cease to exist and their acceptance into heaven would still be assured because it is according to God's mercy and compassion and grace by faith and by the shedding of Christ's blood on the cross and that alone. The chapter ends, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Salvation is this. Salvation is this. Belief in him. Through the shed blood of faith, in Christ, through his death, your sins are entirely atoned. They are paid for. They are put away. They are forgiven. Through faith, in one simple truth, heaven is yours. A place that is prepared for you. It is the end of your journey. It is a sure and certain hope because of grace. And this is why we call it good news. This is why we call it the gospel. This is a new beginning. It's your life in Christ. And it's easy to take hold of. In fact, at Walden Church, we say it's as simple as ABC. You just admit that you're a sinner. There's no shame in admitting you're not perfect. Everyone who sits next to you in church has already admitted that. Every one of us, we are all sinners. Romans 3 says, all have sinned and continue to fall short of God's glory. And guess what? Once you decide to follow Christ, you're still not perfect. But now you are a member of the family. You are a member of the family and you are sitting next to other imperfect people. And that, yes, they are all broken and they are still hurting, but they are a family who loves their Savior. We believe in Jesus. And if you believe that God manifested himself as a human, that he intervened in human history, that he came to walk among us, and he came to show us what it actually looked like to live out 
love and grace and you believe that Jesus is ready to give you that new life. Acts 4 says there is no salvation by anyone else. There is no other name under heaven given among people by which they can be saved. If you could admit that you're a sinner and you believe in Jesus, then the only thing you have left to do is to confess it. Romans 10 says if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's a new life, it's a new beginning, and it's that easy. And I would invite you right now to join me and pray this prayer. Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus so that I could be your friend. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being with me all my life, even when I didn't know it. And I realize I need a savior to set me free from sin, from myself, from all the habits and hurts and hangups that mess up my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I want to repent and I want to live the way that you created me to live. Be the Lord of my life. Save me with grace. I want to learn to love you and trust you and become everything that you made me to be. Thank you for creating me and choosing me to be a part of your family. Amen. I would just invite you that if you prayed that prayer, that you would seek out your local church. Find a body of believers near you. It doesn't have to be the best church, the fanciest church, the biggest church, the flashiest church. Just a group of people that live near you, that share and do life and do community near you, that you would plug into that community, meet them, and allow them to meet you. Have conversations, ask questions, and continue to pursue truth above all else. I pray that you have a blessed year. I pray that you grow in your faith. I pray that you know this Jesus more and more. That you leave your worries, your concerns, and your troubles at the foot of the cross, and you turn and you walk away and you live unburdened. And that you carry this joy forever till the end of your days. Go in grace, go in peace, go in love. I'll see you guys next week.